This episode of Crime World was originally published in April 2021. It's kind of like the perfect murder mystery. It's kind of forever caught uh, in this halfway house. Only God knows who committed the murder. There are those who will forever believe that Ian Bailey, uh, the murder suspect, was in fact the murderer. And others will feel that Ian Bailey has, even if innocent, has brought a lot of the suspicion upon himself. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're listening to Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the sins of the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. It reads like a script from an Agatha Christie murder mystery. A beautiful young French woman bludgeoned to death at her idyllic holiday home. A community, sickened by the attack, realise there's a killer amongst them. And a struggling police force find more questions than answers. 25 years since the body of Sophie Toscan de Plantier was discovered discarded in rural Skull, two major documentary series are being finalised for release. Murder at the Cottage, directed by award-winning Jim Sheridan and produced by investigative journalist Donald McIntyre, will be shown on Sky next month and will detail the twists and turns in the case. Focus in on the self-professed chief suspect Ian Bailey and examine how the stunning landscape of West Cork created one of the most intriguing murder mysteries in recent decades. This week, I'm joined by my former colleague, Donald McIntyre, who has been immersed in the case of Sophie Toscan de Plantier since 2014, when he first examined the story for the Sunday World. He tells me why he was gripped by the mystery, how he and his team have filmed hundreds of hours of footage for his new series, and he clears up a few myths that have dogged the investigation for years. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. I was looking back over the Sunday World archive today and it was 2014 that you and I were down in West Cork and I think where you met Ian Bailey for the first time. That's true. I think we walked down and we were kind of slightly nervous because, you know, he, he has this reputation and, of course, image of being this kind of larger than life, scary character. And um, I, I imagine many journalists who've walked down that road did so nervously. But um, if I remember, he took us in, was incredibly polite. I think we got tea or coffee, whatever we desired. And uh, that was the start of a, of a kind of uh, long obsession with the case. But it was extraordinary that uh, just that, you know, how relaxed he was inviting the press in if you were running a media strategy for somebody uh, under that kind of suspicion, a bit like some corporate PR strategy, you would, if you had nothing to hide, invite the public in. And that's what Ian has always said. On the other hand, anything you say will and may be used against you in a court of law and in the court of public opinion. So it was quite a risky strategy. Um, but I don't think it was ever part of a coordinated strategy. It was just, it's kind of part of his personality. Uh, it's interesting that um, as part of our story and our research for the story, I connected with some of his old longtime friends and former journalists going back 40 years, the only people who have known him for 40 years. And, uh, and these are people who worked with him as a journalist back in Cheltenham and in Bristol and that whole area back in the day. And they said that he always wanted to be kind of the centre of attention. And they're a big concern for him now, having uh, now being caught in this purda, this kind of, uh, this, this purgatory halfway between uh, an innocent man in Ireland and a guilty man in France, they were always concerned, okay, what now for Ian Bailey? You know, there is no magnet of attention for him and, what, and they were quite concerned. So maybe a symptom of that kind of attention deficit disorder that Ian has uh, is that, you know, what now for him now that, you know, his raison d'etre for, for defending himself permanently, that's gone away. And it's ironic that, that that has gone away when there's two series about to come out, international series about him and the case. So, and yours being, uh, you're, be, you're the producer on Making at the Cottage, Murder at the Cottage, excuse mm. me, which you've made with Jim Sheridan, a five-part documentary going to be on Sky. 
I think it's coming out in the next week or two. But um, have you been actually spending all that time since 2014 with Ian Bailey? Well, I basically, yeah, myself and Ian, we've been, we've been in contact at least once a week. We've filmed, you know, tens and tens and, you know, hundreds of hours with Ian Bailey, myself and the team. And so basically uh, the gestation of the project is kind of long and varied, but effectively um, in we, I was working on it, as you know, with you and then in 2015, and then we brought it to the BBC the BBC wanted a very recognisable director. And then I brought Jim on board and um, uh, we started filming with the family and with Ian back then. And the the plan was to have a 360 degree access. We've got the prime murder suspect, Ian Bailey, and we've got the family and we've got two opposing forces. And they were very keen to give us access, um, and, which, of course, we availed of. And it's quite unusual to have that kind of degree of access, because normally you've got to take either one side or the other. So you have a uh, you have to kind of you know jump into bed with with either uh, perspective. But in this case, both parties understood that we were on a different journey, and they allowed us to go on that journey. And here we are, God, two thousand and and twenty one, May two thousand and twenty one, on a journey that we started. It's all your fault, Nicola. I, I mean, I could have. <laughs> I could have been doing yeah. travel programs since then. But no, uh, I don't know. What did you think of him? Well, I remember standing outside on the road that time and having a discussion with you about, you know, whether we should go in or whether we should, maybe it was in our nature not to be quite as open about what we were doing at the time because we were doing a lot of investigative work and it would have mm. been more in our nature to be a bit sneaky. But I think we sort of just decided to rattle in and found ourselves in the most beautiful country garden um, mm. absolutely beautiful wildflowers everywhere, yeah. a kind of a water landscape. I was just so, I was just, my breath was taken away by how gorgeous it was. And then of course he was, he was beside us talking and it turned out he had made all these things in the garden yeah. and he'd created it. And we went in and his wife, Jules, or his partner, Jules Thomas had the most beautiful artwork. They were just very bohemian, weren't they? And kind of very West Cork. The two of them. Well, yeah, I'm very scholar can fail that sense of the kind of the blow in. They'd been there for 30 years and uh, um, and still blow ins. But yeah, very welcoming. And you know, it's um, you know, it's an ext- it's an ext- it simply is an extraordinary story. It was extraordinary back then in 2014, but even now, all the more extraordinary because here you have, in many ways, uh, if you remove yourself uh, from the personalities and the individuals and the, the loss and the terrible loss suffered from by Sophie's family. But it's kind of like the perfect murder mystery. It's kind of forever caught uh, in this halfway house. You know, he is a convicted murderer in France. He's a free man in Ireland. And logic would tell you that he's never going to put himself in jeopardy for extradition uh, for the European arrest warrant. And therefore, the, the, the case is set in stone as a kind of status quo. So for sure, only God knows who committed the murder and people will forever have their suspicions. And I suspect, you know, there are those who will forever believe that Ian Bailey, uh, the murder suspect, was in fact the murderer as the French courts have found. And those who feel that, um, you know, he is innocent. And then, of course, there'll be those who will feel that, you know, the the police investigation simply just wasn't... uh, uh, up to standard um, and others will feel that Ian Bailey has even if innocent has brought a lot of the suspicion upon himself so uh, it is in many ways you know a perplexing and extraordinary murder mystery that's not to take away from the uh, desperate pain the French family have suffered and the extraordinary battle they've waged over decades to keep Sophie's story alive and the investigation alive And Sophie, of course, at the heart of this story, a middle class Parisian brought up on the left bank, third wife of Daniel Toscan Duplantier, a film director. Um, She'd been coming to Ireland at least five years, I think, by the time she was married to this idyllic little holiday home, uh, which again, we we visited that time we were down. But uh, 
She, she'd arrived in just before Christmas, rented a car in Dublin Airport, driven down to Skull and made her way to her holiday home and uh, was discovered dead in horrific circumstances on the morning, I think, of the, uh, the 21st of December, 1996. There were so many peculiarities to all that. Firstly, because it was Christmas time, um, her body lay there for 24 hours before the pathologist arrived. Um, it was a part of Ireland that there hadn't been too many murders like this. So uh, a lot of extra help was brought in, drafted in from Dublin, from the, the specialist units. And certainly when we were having a little look at it, and you've obviously taken a much more deep dive into it, but there was a lot of kind of mistakes made in those early days. I think I think there was a kind of, I mean, the murder investigation probably got no better or no worse an investigation than most murders at the time. Um, and I think there was a lot of gut instinct and a lot of intuition and the science of DNA was coming in there and certainly was, it, it certainly was uh, part of the paradigm uh, at the time. But I think Christmas probably killed the investigation, if I'm honest. You know, um, uh, officers were down, it was overtime, there was distractions, John Harbison was down late. Um, and so there were a lot of uh, early kind of fluff failures, you know. And I think but the biggest failure probably was uh, the in, in, entire, I, to my mind, reflecting on, upon it, is that uh, I, uh, the Gardaí overly focused on Ian Bailey exclusively um, rather than as part of a constituency of potential suspects. Now, to give the Gardaí uh, their due, they tried to seek out other uh, suspects, like you would logically do in France, but 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 in France, the, the the French police, when they went over there to seek assistance, they were roundly rejected and said, "Listen, you will not be investigating any French citizens and taking out statements from French citizens on French soil. That's not the, uh, what you're going to be doing." So they were kind of uh, um, uh, knocked back, and I think Ian did present himself as a. Uh, as an early suspect, and a kind of re, it's not an unreasonable suspicion, you know. I mean, uh, the plot of, of of his story and his involvement sounds like a Channel Five afternoon movie. The reporter covering the case suddenly becomes the prime suspect, and I think um, I think part of the reason why he became a prime suspect is because I don't think the Irish press, as a press corps, I mean, or the Gardaí gave him any kudos as a journalist and therefore legitimacy to be on site because I've done an investigation of his uh, work and I've met his colleagues who worked with him back in the day and this was an experienced reporter who was cutting his teeth in journalism since the age of 18. He was covering court cases, probably reported on about 17 murders himself hugely experienced, did a great deal of investigative work and stories he sold to the uh, Sunday Times. And uh, this is a man who ran his own agency. This is, you know, so he was uh, smart and sharp and hungry, and he could, sh you know, sharpen his elbows out with other journalists and steal the odd story left and right, as, as, as you'd imagine a good freelancer would do. So this is an experienced and talented journalist. And I think, I think his legitimacy to be on site was never given the credibility that it, it deserved. And I think that's part of the suspicion kind of rested upon him. And then, of course, when he ended up writing stuff that few enough people would have known, half, uh, well, the, the Gardaí would have said, hold on a second, he knows stuff that only we know about the crime scene. And then um, other journalists would say, well, he surprised me with his knowledge of the scene. But then again, that's why we hire stringers. You know, and he was much more experienced than your average local stringer. So that added to the complexity. So did he know it, the information he knew, which he shouldn't have known necessarily, because he was a good stringer and a very good journalist who was very experienced, or did he do it, know it because he was uh, in some way uh, culpable in the crime? Was that really the, what, what put him at the centre of the investigation and as what became the chief and only suspect, that he wrote about things that he shouldn't have known? No, that wasn't the only one. I mean, end of the day, he's the tallest guy at the scene. He uh, had been violent to his ex, to his partner. You know, he was boorish. 
you know, back in the day when I used to talk to Clive Driscoll and when he was a young police officer back in England uh, in the 70s, and, you know, he said his senior sergeants would be saying to him, listen, if a murder like this took place, what you do, you arrest the traveller or the oddball. He was the oddball and he was the journalist and he knew too much and he had a history of violence and he lived very nearby. And it seemed to everybody, and I think to us too, uh, it's, it's such a remote place. When we say remote place, even if you're in school, you need very sophisticated directions and advice about how to get there because it's easy, you're easily lost there. So you, you might think only a local or somebody with local knowledge could, perpetrate, could have perpetrated the crime or, or somebody who knew Sophie uh, very well and had been to the property before. So that combination... But uh, that's not to, I raised the issue of the of his role as a reporter because I felt, and I've long felt that, that there was a kind of, you know, that he was, he was denuded of any qualities of being a real journalist. But actually, when you look back in the day, not only did he write all the articles for the Times and, and for the Sun and the Daily Mirror and the, and the Star, and as a freelancer, you've uh, agency person, you've got to be able to write to each marketplace. But he ran his own agency in the end and um, before he came to Ireland. Uh, so he was pretty accomplished. So I think it's, it's, it is a factor. And of course, Donald, when he was, uh, you know, when he did come under, you know, under suspicion, he kind of embraced that a bit. And he kind of, I mean, from memory, he certainly, like, as he welcomed you and I in that day, he certainly didn't, uh, he wasn't abhorred when anybody suggested he was a suspect. In actual fact, I think he ended up being named because of his own reaction to it, because he called himself the chief suspect, which meant that he was unveiled as that. Um, So it's like as if he sort of embraced the whole thing. Well, he wasn't shy about coming forward. That's for sure. But I, I've just been looking at a bit of archive and um, it's it's a news footage around the time. And I just saw it just about a half an hour ago and it shows Ian Bailey meeting reporters and he comes out and he, and he says, you know, you know, I didn't do it. And the news reporter said very unusually, uh, Ian Bailey had been named. I think it was a very famous Pat Kenny interview uh, where he interviewed Ian. But he said very unusually the, the murder suspect was named without being charged. And, uh, and that's because Ian came out to defend himself and said, listen, I'm under suspicion. I have nothing to hide. I'm happy to, to state my case, and which he did. But then, of course, then there are the, um, you know, I, I often, I've had long conversations with Jim and I said, you know, I said, there's a little bit uh, of Ian uh, where if you, if, you say, if you take the fact that and say, as the Irish law states, that he is innocent of this murder, then why would he continually fly into the sun, uh, into the, the, the flame of, of suspicion and continue to place himself around there with kind of his black humour, he would say, in terms of talking about uh, the murder to Maliki Reed, uh, the Shelleys, and some other um, kind of hints at a confession uh, and at confessions um, that he's made over the years, about uh, four, maybe five. And so, you know, it seems to me that the, his ro- this role as the perennial suspect, not convicted, is a kind of, a, a kind of Jacques uh, moment where it's a kind of role which kind of perfectly suited him. So he, he, without suffering, I suppose, the penalty of being convicted in an Irish uh, court and then going to jail... Uh, you know, what were the rewards that came his way? Well, if he was an attention seeker, these were well satisfied. If he wanted to be the subject of international documentaries by Netflix and Sky, Jim Sheridan, and have competing, you know, uh, you know, huge corporate engines competing for his story and, uh, and, uh, and his words, then he has achieved everything, you know, he, he, he wanted to. But, um, you know, it's been a, at a terrible cost. So for those, and legally Ian is innocent, but for those uh, who believe truly in his innocence, uh, you have to imagine, you know, to be under that kind of suspicion would have been horrific. Um, But then again, you know, Ian did bring a little bit of that suspicion upon himself unnecessarily, and and that's for him to account for. 
There's a few little things I want to ask you about, about the actual murder. See, did yourself and Jim Sheridan um, actually, you know, discover that, you know, did you, were you able to separate truth from fiction about it? A couple of things that were said over the years. Firstly, that um, the gate went missing. Secondly, that there was two wine glasses out on the kitchen table, which would suggest that she had company that night and had shared, um, you know, a bottle of wine with her killer. Thirdly, that she had slept in the bed uh, before fleeing the house. And uh, lastly, that there could have been, she could have been knocked over by an animal. Well, uh, just in reverse order in terms of <laughs> preposterous things. No, I don't think there's any evidence, any suggestion, a, a rational suggestion uh, that uh, she was mowed down by a, uh, a runaway a horse, horse. wasn't it? Yes. A runaway horse. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I mean, <clears throat> it does capture the imagination as a random afterthought. It doesn't populate it doesn't populate the five anywhere in the five programs. It just, uh, you know, if we had six programs or seven, and to be honest, we could have fitted in 10 programs because even within five programs, five 50-minute programs, the detail is so immense. It, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to get it all in. So in respect of um, uh, reverse order, uh, where she slept, she never slept in her bedroom that night. She slept in an additional side bedroom because it was pretty cold and the heating was off. So she she enjoyed, she slept in a futon or a mattress on the floor. There was some books around and maybe a, a glass. And she had, um, uh, because she was able to get the heat up from the kitchen, uh, from the kitchen there. So um, so that's that. That's where she slept. Her her own bedroom was a remarkable piece. It was she had her books of um, you know uh, Yeats, Irish poets, and the bed was elevated so she could see out uh, her bedroom window and see the Fastnet Lighthouse, which really was a beacon for her. It must have been a kind of anchor for her in her kind of chaotic life and in a life which you know at the time we heard in France and she wasn't particularly happy. You know, both herself and Daniel had lovers, and he he was married um, and was having a relationship at the time, and eventually married his lover eighteen months later, and they had a baby um, within a year of of Sophie's uh, uh, death, and so and it's interestingly uh, in a very bourgeois French way that Daniel Toscan de Plante wrote in a statement, sent a statement over within weeks of the murder, saying that, uh, you know, Sophie would never have had an affair. And to putting on this kind of bourgeois defence, you know, and, oh, no, would never have an affair. And, of course, he knew very well, I'm sure, and their marriage was secure and all of this stuff. So it was a kind of uh, an odd statement, but it was interesting that they were protecting the bourgeois class, class uh, system in France. Uh, and it was equally bizarre that when they had the funeral for, um, I'm digressing a bit, for, uh, for Sophie, um, that uh, the priest who ran the service, uh, you know, s- practically excluded Sophie entirely from the narrative. It was all about references to uh, Daniel Toscan de Plantier, his films and everything. And this must have been very painful to the uh, 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 Bonnois and the French family. And they eventually, la- uh, later, they had the body uh, moved into their own family plot. And then, of course, the body was um, exhumed from there for further DNA testing. So um, uh, in respect of whether she ran from her bedroom, I think the interesting thing about that, so what happened, just to focus on what do we think happened, um, well, we came across an awful lot of information which we simply couldn't put I- I- into the documentary. And one of the one of the interesting lines which we've come across, which isn't in the documentary, as along with you know ten or twenty other interesting lines, but it's one which we might develop for a feature documentary or another project or a second series. And it's it's this: is that um, there was blood on the handle of the door. Uh, and uh, then she she had her her boots on. One was laced up. These kind of kind of uh, kind of ankle boots, but you know they weren't slippers on. So uh, the unusual thing, and she was kind of dressed in kind of uh, you know not not pajamas, but she was dressed in 
uh, in lycra. So it could be sporty lycra, but you could easily imagine that she might very well be wearing those if she's cold and chilly and has moved there. So um, there were tech glasses uh, and some cutlery out there. No, no indication that anybody had drunk from the glasses in the kitchen. But where what was really curious was uh, somehow she either ran or walked down or was called. And, you know, because this is all conjecture. She, this, you know, she walked down and came and her body was stand at the gate. So obviously she came from the gate. Which way did she come down? Did she come down the pathway, which is the way that, you know, her assailant would have come up to her house. Did her assailant walk up to the house or did the assailant drive up? Who knows? We Again, so little is known of this, of a case that has actually consumed, you know, hundreds of hours of documentaries and, and millions of, of, of words in, in newsprint and in books. And so the body is down there. Harbison says in, injuries caused by a big brick Um uh, our, one of our pathologists we spoke to raised an interesting line and said that uh, we think she was likely to be strangled uh, in advance of the brick being pummeled down on top of her. Two reasons for that. There was blood collecting on the back of the rock uh, behind her head. And secondly, there were definitely strangulation marks there. And, and thirdly, the breeze blocks, as we saw when we were there, I mean, the breeze blocks, one of which, you know, helped kill her, was involved in the, in the, in the murder. They were all there. And they, they just, I think, recently have just been removed. So, and you're thinking, they're big, heavy blocks. And so, you know, she was a feisty, fit, you know, young 39-year-old mother of one. You know, she's not going to stay still while a man, no matter how big, is going to drop a brick on her. So the pathologist we spoke to suggested that she must have been already incapacitated. He rose and brought up a remarkable line. He said, Harbison suggests there are cuts on the face. Um, and there's a hint that it may have been caused by the edge of one of the bricks. But he, you know, distinctly says, I believe uh, that it's caused by a knife. And, uh, and I said, what kind of knife? And he said, uh, you know, it could have been... Um, you know, cheese knife, but it's not a kind of traditional bread knife. And and, and he said the, the cuts are very distinctive. And he would say absolutely a knife. So that's where he differs from Harbison. Uh, he didn't he didn't criticize Harbison particularly for for, for for the investigation. But he also said we can't tell when she died. So that's just we just can't. And the estimation of when somebody died is really really difficult. It's helpful when you when you try and know when she's food in her tummy and some of it digested. So it's within six hours of the digestive juices in her stomach, you can tell. So um, either she had breakfast early, uh, six hours before she was found, or else it was, you know, um, it was some sometime uh, she ate late. But either which way, he postulated the theory that, he said, if you look in the house and uh, not everything in the house was was dusted and DNA'd. Going to house. If you go back to the kitchen, he said the bread. He said he said the the bread was a knife positioned in the loaf of bread. And he said if if perpetrators use a knife, they typically uh, either throw it in a nearby bush, drive down the road, throw it in the stream, and they discard it like that. Or they often return it to the scene of the crime and wash it. And he said what was he and, and uh, is a fresh but eyes um, a kind of forensic physician on this and he said that knife in the kitchen which we now know was not forensically examined by the by the guard the dna tested or, or fingerprinted um, looks like it was positioned as if it was staged so he raises the proposition that the blood from the crime scene was that the perpetrator returned to the house to wash the murder weapon and the gate the gate has gone missing the gate, the blood on the gate was all her was identified as as Sophie's as Sophie's uh, blood, um, and there was only one bit of blood on the crime scene, which was it seemed to belong to somebody else. It, it, they could at the time in 1997, and in, when it was redone by the French in 2008, indicated that there was blood on her shoe, which indicated it was male blood. So, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't um, 
glean any further information from that. What's interesting about that is that the science, you and I know Clive Driscoll, who solved the Stephen Lawrence case. He spent £3 million on a, on a 1996 uh, case um, uh, in 2011 to secure a conviction in 2013 for the, the Lawrence two for two of the five suspects involved in that, uh, because he says the science of forensic analysis has changed so much. And on a monthly basis, there's an exponential rise in the opportunities. So what couldn't deliver evidence into 1997 and 2008 could very well deliver evidence in 2021. So I would say if we're ever going to actually definitively get an answer to this, it will rest with the still forensic opportunities, which is disappointing because there are 20 key items which were collected by Gardaí at the time, which, at my last estimation, have gone missing and are not accounted for. So um, I can imagine how smaller items have gone missing and they have in the past in cases, but a gate is particularly spectacular, isn't it, to lose? Yeah, the gate was given to her as a gift, I think, um, by one of her neighbours. And uh, yeah, it is hard to imagine. I mean, it, it is it is unforgivable, you know, and... Um, it just is unforgivable. It just, you know, and it's inexplicable, you know. Just describe a little bit what this documentary is going to be like for people who are going to tune in because, you know, five five parts. So we're going to get a really deep dive into this whole case. I presume it's going to be a bit more arty than just a kind of a, a cold case investigation into this. We're going to be looking at the relationships and the dynamics that exist between the various people involved. But um well, I think I think you know you'd be surprised. I mean, Jim Jim uh, Sheridan, like all artists, is an obsessive, and he brings, I think, something very different to it. You know, he has the same kind of obsessive quality that investigative journalists have, and whenever he's doing his own programs and his own films, he obviously gets immersed into it and, and absorbed by every single detail. But I think he brings to it uh, uh, something above and beyond a cold case investigative journalist, which kind of some of the stuff which we do. He brings something, a connection to the landscape, an ethereal sense of placing it in the poetry and magic of the landscape, the area. He can connect Sophie's world, Daniel's world of film and can, and also he knows the area of skull. He knows the history. You know, he can connect the history of the French and, and Irish legal systems. And so he brings an ethereal and kind of really poetic, philosophical uh, kind of thought process to the crime, as well as, you know, actually talking to everybody. I mean, everybody will talk to Jim and, and it's very, very rare that anybody we've kind of arranged won't speak to Jim and discuss these matters with him. So he's, you know, so I think we will get a character portrait of Ian Bailey over the years. We'll obviously get covered the story from, from and the investigation from 1996 all the way to uh, the current day. And we'll, we'll travel this with the uh, uh, Sophie's family and her son, Pierre-Louis, who has basically fought the campaign. And we'll meet all kind of characters and we'll deal with, all the key controversies, um, but I think it, it, it is a. Um, I think it, you know it's it's been very difficult to condense you know twenty five years uh, of this uh, murder story into um, the kind of the case in journalistic terms, the story that keeps on giving um, uh, into in, into uh, these five shows. But I think no, I think uh, we've had a great team in it, and I think Jim's been great. I think he brings a different authorship to it. And I think the audience will appreciate that. So I wouldn't say, I mean, it's very, we, we think it's a high standard, high class documentary. Sky have been great partners in this. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I hope the audience will be enthralled. And I think, uh, I, I think the detail, there was a, a there was a paradigm that all crime and documentary stories, every murder had to fit into 43 minutes on ITV and 58 minutes on the BBC. And then, of course, drama started to unpick these, um, these, these crimes in a fictional sense. And then documentary suddenly realized with the making of a murder and with the podcast and digital era that actually people wanted the detail. They wanted to have an ability to become their own DIY detectives and... Um, so I'm sure they'll really appreciate uh, this long form journey that we've gone with with uh, on with Jim and of course that Jim kick started in 2014. 
And finally, Donal, after so many years of being immersed in planet Ian Bailey, um, mm. how are you getting on with him? Uh, well, fine. I mean, uh, you know, it's a very sad, it's kind of, it's a very sad predicament. Um, Ian has been, you know, and I tend to lean on the uh, legal position that I don't think there's sufficient evidence to at all to consider to to consider him guilty at all. Uh, I'm with the Irish DPP and other uh, people in relation to that, and other rational journalists will have different views. So it's a very s- terribly sad story. I think uh, he's now is effectively homeless. He's been given his marching cards, a legal letter about a month ago. And, um, you know, um, I'm pleased for Jules that she, as, you know, as a victim of domestic abuse, that she's had the courage to to leave Ian. I know that will be a wrench for Ian, just on a very human level and very traumatic for him. But uh, she has stood by him, you know, through thick and thin and bruises and beatings over the years. And uh, so, uh, but now um, having secured this static, this status quo, where he no, is no longer in legal jeopardy for the first time in 25 years, he now finds himself homeless and bereft. And this is a, a guy who who built the gardens uh, at the prairie. He, he, he was a stone, I was there when he built the stone walls around the house and the beautiful gardens and just it's a, it's a luscious West Cork garden, you know, you know, born out of the kind of rough soil, but the, but the Gulf Stream and it's extraordinary and uh, now he'll never replicate that. So, so um, for those who regard Ian as innocent, uh, then they look upon um, this as a, just a very tragic, tragic end. Um, he's still young enough to be able to kind of resurrect some kind of life for himself. And he's, uh, but I think, um, uh, you know, an anchor in his life is gone. For those who, who forever will believe in Bailey guilty, I think they'll just think just deserves. And will home continue to be West Cork? Well, I think for him, um, he obviously can't, he can't travel outside the island of Ireland, can't travel indeed, you know, beyond uh, uh, the, the, the 26 counties. So, you know, would he go to Cork City? Well, the problem is he, there's so little accommodation in, in that part of the country. But he, you know, um, you know, he's, I think, I think he's looking at a pretty dire, you know, financial situation. You know, he'd be on benefits. He'll he won't have accommodation. He won't have funding. Um, he won't, in many ways, have the company of the journalists which have been following him around for the last uh, 10, 15 years. But he will have, you know, this strange uh, situation where he will be now, you know, there's, you know, international uh, people will know his name everywhere, you know, Netflix and Sky and the Sky shows will be sold around the world. And it's like, you know, as, so he'll still have that attention. So I can easily see people, you know, doing a runny uh, bigs on him, you know, like they did with the great train robber in Brazil, tracking him down and, you know, paying him money to tell, uh, uh, you know, uh, the stories or defend his position. But at the moment, you know, um, you might even be worried for somebody like Ian, you know, because he really has lost everything. And um, so it's a very precarious time for him. So I'm with his friends going back the years, you know, who who knew him um, back when he was a news reporter. And and they're kind of worried for him. You know, what is Ian going to do now? Most of his life has been about defending himself against the murder he, he he. he said he never committed. And now when he no longer has to do that, you know, what else is in his life? Well, at the moment, nothing. Mm. Well, I look forward to tuning in. You might be glad to know that I finally got my television in order and signed up to Sky only recently. So I actually can just press the button and uh, have a look. So I, I'm looking forward to it. Donald McIntyre, thank you very much. Pleasure. From sundayworld.com, this is Crime World, produced by Ian Mullaney. Available online and on all podcast platforms. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review. And if you want to get in touch, check out our Facebook page, Crime World with Nicola Talent.